through something kind of small um, last night because um, I feel grateful to have the opportunity um, to have this conversation in our class um, for many reasons. Um, certainly one of them being, you know, we've, we've not been face to face for so long. And even though we're wearing masks and still worried about capacity and things like that and still have a webinar, it's just so wonderful that, that we can come together again. So that means a lot, I know, to all of us. So I, my printer was broken this morning. And as my students know, we, have, uh, we do not have a reliable printer on this campus at any given time, sadly. Um, so I couldn't get to print out, so I'm going to have to just read this off my phone. But I was thinking it would be so nice if I could just memorize it. It's, it's barely a paragraph. But I was uh, reminded by um, something that Queen Mai said in her essay about writing. Um, the mountains sing and how important it is to write things down and what I could say on paper, obviously as a writer, um, you know, I might be able to memorize it and summarize it in some way, but there was a reason why I wrote down what I did. So I want to make sure that I, I read it that way. Before this conversation between two writers on two sides of the Vietnam War, which I stole from Wayne's email that he sent me last night. Uh, Wayne and Quay Mai, this conversation between friends. I just want to say that getting here to this day, talking about Quay Mai's work, all of us, students and teacher, thinking about what the work says has been a gift. A gift because of the great voice in writing, yes, but a greater gift. And that the work has the power to invite the idea of other people, seemingly times long ago, but not really to invite history and heart, the two together, so that young people can feel where feelings come from. And I do believe that we've, we've had a lot of conversation about this um, to generate that feeling and, and think about something else and someone else and other people. Um, it is that someone else's story can make someone else want to know something more. As one of my students said of, Am I wondering what was one of the first books that made you cry? I thought, what an interesting question, just coming from the little bit that we've read. Or wondering how was writing the Mountain Sing, dealing with all of the emotion and truth recovering, how wonderful it is to encourage courage and education. So as I said earlier, it's been a while, um, but it's so nice to have Ho and Kui Mai and Wayne here and this wonderful conversation. And thank you guys for working with me um, the past few weeks. You all have been wonderful. And I know we don't get to spend a whole lot of time together anymore where we have to rush through everything. But I think that something like this has allowed us to slow down a little bit and talk a little bit more intimately together than just running through your typical essay. So thank you and welcome. And I'm going to go sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, in addition to all the students and guests here today, we also have people in Zoom, on Zoom. So I don't know really whom I'm speaking to. But my name is Ho Nguyen. Uh, I'm not a writer. I was uh, drafted into this class today, yes, from probably yesterday, over a bottle of Chardonnay and some roasted oyster on the riverbank. And uh, I guess the Chardonnay got better of me and I'm here. So my only claim to fame is that I'm a friend of these two luminaries. One is a local writer, uh, Wayne Carlin, uh, Professor Carlin, and Dr. Nguyen San Kui Mai. Uh, but before I go further, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dwyer for, and the members of the Connection Committee for making this possible to bring this author here. And also to uh, Professor Smith, and 
all your students for being uh, out in our audience today and having us. Okay. Um, we will have, I will make sure, so I'm basically the moderator. I will make sure that we have time for you to ask questions. And hopefully there'll be some questions arising from the discussion today. Now, it is amazing that I'm sitting next to this, for me, a young Vietnamese woman. She's not Vietnamese American, she's Vietnamese. And yet her very first book is written in English. It's just astounding. I have lived in this country over 60 years. And yet there's no way I can write anything like this, even if I, if I wanted to. Um, and to all the writers sitting further to my left, Wayne, is a real local treasure. Uh, I will speak briefly about him and go back to uh, Quay Mai. Uh, when I'd like to order local author, Tom Clancy. I guess some of you may have read Tom Clancy's work and watch his movie. Uh, they are different kind of writers. When I read their novels, when I read their work, I cry. It made me think. I read Clancy work just for entertainment and when I'm done with a book, I put it aside and forget about it. Like The Hunt for the Red October. It's just a novel, it's just entertaining. But these people, these writers, these friends of mine here, Wayne I and Wayne, what they do, they make the reader think. They make the readers cry. And I hope that you will get to cry too. I hope that you get to read this book. And her other book, which is a book of poetry, hopefully she will have time to read some of that for us all today. Okay. But going back to Wayne, um, I'm not going to speak the script. Please, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne was born and raised up in, in uh, New York City. And he's a baby boomer, about my age. Baby boomer mean people born right after the Second War. They shouldn't have anything in common. They're different generations. She was born in Vietnam. A couple of years before the war, the US war in Vietnam ended. So in terms of generation, there's a big gap. So why are they sitting as friends here? Well, because they have something in common. They, they both told me that since very early days in their life, they wanted to write. They wanted to be writers. They wanted to be author. They wanted to put their ideas and feelings on true paper, and I'm so glad they do because we get to read these things. Okay. And at one time, um, at age of 18, I suppose, uh, when joined the US Marines, you know, put on the uniform, went to Vietnam in the 60s, and he was willing and ready to kill Vietnamese. People like us, so that he could defend democracy so that they could defend the rest of the communists. And yet, whatever happened in Vietnam, he came back after his tour of duty and joined the Vietnam veteran against the war. And better yet for all of us, he became a writer, pursue his childhood dreams. And his topic had always been, and I brought two of his books, he had written eight novels and three work of nonfiction, but this one really moved me to tears. It's called The Wandering Souls. Uh, I just gave you a brief plot. It's basically about a real man, Homer. Like Wayne was in the US Army, he went to Vietnam. Homer killed a Vietnamese soldier who turned out to be medic. And nearly 40 years later, Homer returned the artifacts that he took from the dead Vietnamese body. He sent it back to Vietnam to, hope, to this man's family. His name is Dan. And this book is about that Omar and the family in Vietnam and 
Homer went back to Vietnam with Wayne. And this is really, it's so moving and it's factual. It, it's, it's one of those three work of nonfiction that Wayne wrote. And hopefully I will ask him to read an excerpt from it. Okay, so it's, it's the writing, it's the love or sharing the ideas with people that they become friends and because, and that's how I become their friends as a reader. Now, they also have something else in common, despite the distance and the age and the ethnicity. They both focus on the concept idea of peace among people. Peace. Marines who was willing to spray bullets down the jungle and kill any Vietnamese he could, now embrace them. And she write in a novel, The Mountain Sing, about a grandmother and granddaughter who lived through war. Even though she was not raised up or did not have to live through the war, she was so good at expressing, at, at describing, at sharing this emotion. So that's what they have in common, not just the writing, but what they write about. Reconciliation. Can you imagine how wasteful it is for us to try to spend billions and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars for this uh, military industrial complex? It's not some liberal term. This is what I, Eisenhower views military industrial complex. Can you? Imagine we would all go to school for free. We all would have a good job if the money was spent to do what they are telling us we should do. Reconcile. Why waste the money and human resources? Anyway, uh, I have to watch myself. Time. Okay. Uh, now, pray mine. This is her first book. And yet, last night I looked up uh, Amazon.com. It got over 2,400 reviews and then mostly five stars. And I here have a long list of awards and prizes she received. I will just mention a few. Okay. Uh, in fact, she's here because she, uh, she's on her way to in Ohio to receive uh, an award for uh, Miss Price and Literature. And her book had been translated, this book, into 13 languages. Korean, French, Spanish, Swedish, German. 13, well, Wayne's work had also been translated to at least four different languages. So they're really very, very acclaimed writers. Okay. Um, now, I would like to um, ask you a question first. What was it in your childhood growing up, very poor in southern Vietnam? What, what, what was it about growing up in your early days that motivated you, that inspired you to end up with this novel? Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, you know, standing here, I think back about the time when I grew up in Vietnam with almost nothing, but just the stories that, that kept my hope alive. We did not have uh, enough things to eat. So my mother made sure that I was at least, at least I was rich in the soul. She was singing lullabies to me. She was telling me stories. The most precious possession my family had was a bookshelf. And my father built the bookshelf himself from bamboo. And I had so few books and I read them until the covers fell off. So my father, you know, made hard cover for the books from the carton and he sewed it with his hands. And I, and I, remember the magic of literature that took me 
across the borders that helped me escape poverty, that helped me make friends with other people. And I really wanted to become a storyteller so that I could uh, you know, experience that magic. And I think it's magical for me to be here, to be listening to Professor Ho. Um, I invited him to be on this panel because I was really moved to, to hear his own story. He said that his mother went through the similar experiences with Grandma Ziulan in the mountain sink. In the mountain sink, Grandma Ziulan had to leave her children behind when, he, when she escaped the land reform. And this is exactly what happened to um, Professor Hall's mother. And we have connected so many ways, even though we just met each other. And you know, I remember that um, one of the, the reasons why I had to, to write the mountain thing is that, you know, when I was born, both of my grandmothers had died. So I, I wanted to have a mother. And I think that's the magic of fiction. You can create a world which is so real to you. You can bring the people whom you dream to have to, to be so close to you, to be a part of your life. So I always wanted to have, you know, grandmothers. So that's why I told myself as a child that I would write, one day I would write a book to have a grandmother with a grandmother figure in it. So I would have a grandma. So I had the idea of, of a book with a grandmother and then having grown up in both North, uh, Northern Vietnam and Southern Vietnam, I saw how Vietnam was divided by many historical events. So I had the idea of using Vietnam, uh, using a Vietnamese family to represent Vietnam, to represent how that, that single family was divided, you know, by, by, by different things that happened to us. So yeah, so the initial idea to have the book is to have a grandmother. So thank you for reading the book because by reading the book, you, you, ce you celebrate my love for my grandmothers, the grandmothers whom I don't know because we never, we don't even have uh, their pictures. All I have for my grandmothers are stories that are passed down to me by my parents and through my imagination, and my interviews with many other people that I created Grandma Zilan. Okay, so you talk about your grandmother. And by the way, before I move on, I, I should really express again gratitude that Nguyen Phan Quay Mai, Quay Mai is here today. This is her first stop of a two month long tour. From here, she will move to New York, to Ohio, to California, to Oregon and then to England and then to uh, Australia and who knows where, the next two months. And she will in England, in Lancaster, receive her PhD in English literature. Uh, she had finished the work and she will receive the uh, diploma then, uh, I think in December. But anyway, we are really lucky uh, that she had extended her long journey, a few days to be here with us. So, so we are here today because of a very considerate and generous soul. And now I will ask her, because she talked about her grandmother, I will ask her if she would not mind reading uh, a poem uh, in her book of poetry here. It's called The Secret of Hua Sen. Hua Sen means lotus blossom in Vietnamese. Um, so, would you mind reading uh, by her and the poem I cannot yet name. And this uh, book of poem, poetry, had been translated. One side is English, and other side is Vietnamese. And I will ask uh, my friend Wayne to read the English translation. Okay. I have it. Okay. Page uh, 18, 19. I must say how honored I am to be in conversation today with the Professor Wen Kalin. I've had admired his work for so many years and Professor Kalin has done so much for Vietnamese literature. I don't think I could have been here without him. He opened the pathway for so many writers before me. And you know, for me to be published in English is just something that I could not imagine. And this journey would not have been possible without people 
Lai Wen, who dedicated such big parts of his life to the editing of, of the translations of Vietnamese work and publishing them and introducing voices from Vietnam to the American public. So uh, this, this poem is uh, for my grandmother. The camera right here. Maybe I have to stand here. Okay. Well, stand here. No, you'll be out of the camera. Stand right here. It's good. Bài thơ chưa thể đặt tên. Nâng mắt cơm trên tay những hạt gạo gặp từ cánh đồng và tôi nằm xuống. Từng hạt gạo ngọt thơm như lời su của bà tôi người tôi chưa hề biết mà. Tôi hình dung khuôn mặt bà mềm mại khi bà được chôn vào lòng đất, quần áo tơi tả ra dính chặt với xương. Trận đói năm bốn năm làng tôi đói mồ chôn xác chết. Mồ bà không ai biết, bát cơm nắng miệng cha tôi 65 năm. 65 năm sau hương hồn tổ tiên dẫn cha và tôi đến trước mộ bà. Lần đầu tiên tôi nghe cha gọi mẹ, cánh đồng lúa sau lưng cha run rẩy. Hai chân tôi gắn chặt vào bùn, ngay trong khối hương hồn bà lan tỏa, bám sâu vào rễ, mọc rễ vào ruộng đồng. Bà xe sẽ hát ru gọi lúa chỗ đồng. Nâng bát cơm trên tay tôi đếm từng hạt gạo, từng hạt ống ánh mồ hôi của tổ tiên tôi còng lưng gieo hạt, từng hạt hóng gánh thơm lời ru của bà tôi đơm lên từ đồng đất. Ngoài kia, trong hoàng hôn lời ru của bà tôi khe khe. So now Wayne has to sing too. <laughs> I'll spare you. I'll spare you all that. Uh, I want to say, you know, first of all, um, the idea we had to uh, invite my friend Professor Ho to do this, um, uh, it, it's, it's paying off. I'm so touched by it. Uh, the way you introduced us and the way you put your heart into it, it's so much better than reading a list of awards and, and so on. And Kwe uh, Mai, you know, thank you for your remarks, but uh, it's been it's been such a privilege to be able to work with you and to have you here. And I'm very grateful. And before I before I read the English translation, I want to read the um, footnote that's there. And by the way, the English translation, I also want to thank uh, the poet Bruce Weigel, who's a, who's a friend of mine and a friend of Quay Mai's who edited. Um, the footnote is this, the Vietnamese famine of 1945 occurred in Northern Vietnam from October 1944 to May 1945 during the Japanese occupation of French Indochina in World War II. Between 400,000 and 2 million people are estimated to have starved to death during this time. And Clay Mai's grandmother was one, of, was one of those people. And this is an important context for, for the poem and for what she writes. Titled, The Poem I Can't Yet Name. My hands lift high a bowl of rice, the seeds harvested in the field where my grandmother was laid to rest. Each rice seed tastes sweet as the sound of lullaby the grandmother I never knew. I imagine her soft face as they laid her down into the earth, clothes battered, her skin stuck to her bones in the great hunger of 1945. My village was starved for graves to bury all the dead. Nobody could find my grandmother's grave. So my father tasted bitter rice for 65 years. After 65 years of searching, Spirits of my ancestors led my father and me to my grandmother's grave. I heard my father call mom for the first time, the rice field behind his back trembled. 
My feet clung to the mud. I listened in the burning incense, how my grandmother's soul spread, joining the earth, taking root in the field, where she quietly sang lullabies, calling the rice plants to blossom. Lifting a bowl of rice in my hands, I count every seed, each one glistening with the sweat of my ancestors, their backs bent in the rice fields, the fragrance of my grandmother's lullaby alive on each one. We're waiting for the singing. <laughs> the last verse, imagine that being sung. <laughs> uh, so Rachel, I, I, I call you professor and professor and professor and doctor, but now we can go back to uh, first name basis. Rachel, have your student met the mountains sing? Okay, so then I know where we're coming from. Anyway, uh, now I have a question for, for uh, and when I'm in Vietnamese, mean older brother, big brother, he's uh, 51 weeks older than I. Uh, I was born post war. Luckily, I was born in, in June uh, 1946. It is significant because right after the famine. But I grew up without much, not much food either. And that's why Vietnamese are very petite. <laughs> The only way we grow now when in my 70s sideways. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had more nutrition when in the 40s and 50s, so I could be a bit taller. But anyway, <laughs> neither here nor there. And Wayne, I, I this book of yours, The Wandering Soul, also made me cry. And by the way, one of the few um, um, uh, I, I read Frank McCourt, the Irish writer, Angela Ashes, that made me cry. Not many books make me cry. This one did. What, what, what inspired you? What's the genesis? How did you come as a get to that to write this book? I've been, um, by the time that this came around, I've been working with, um, as Kwe Mai said, with the Vietnamese writers. Um, and all that came out of uh, a meeting that we had with Vietnamese writers, with American veterans who'd been on our side and Vietnamese writers uh, who were on the other side of the war. And out of, that, out of that meeting, because of the way that we related to each other, you know, these are people who would have killed each other at one point, and there we are living together, having breakfast together and sharing each other's stories. And because we were all writers who believed in the in the power of stories, you know that that you cannot dehumanize another person once you know that they are that they share your humanity. And the way you know that is when you know their stories, when you know what what you have in what you have in common and and what you need to respect as as being different. So this particular book came about, um, you know, years later. About ten years ago, when when the the person in the book, Homer Steedley, knew that I was working with the Vietnamese in that way, and he came to me and and said that um, he had killed another a Vietnamese soldier during the war. One of it wasn't the only person he had killed. It was the only person that he had seen face to face, and actually took the notebooks that were on the body um, home and sent them home to his mother. And 40 years later, he was still suffering from PTSD from, from the war. And the way his wife encouraged him to deal with that was to go back and you know look, think about what he did during the war because he blocked out much of it. And when he did that, he found the papers he'd taken from, from Dom, from the Vietnamese soldier he killed. And he, and he contacted me and said that, um, what I would really like to do is give these back to his family. So that became our mission, and that was the, the, you know, the genesis of, of the book. Would you read a passage from that book, maybe that would explain something?
when I first met Vietnamese writers who'd been on the other side of the war, I sat across a breakfast table and looked into the eyes of a woman who had once been in the Youth Volunteers Brigade of the People's Army of Vietnam, one of the teenage girls who worked on the Ho Chi Minh trails, repairing craters after our bombings, defusing or exploding unexploded bombs, even burying the dead. The times and some of the places we had been in the war had overlapped and looking at her face, I knew that if I had seen her when I was flying as a helicopter gunner, I would have killed her. She'd been a target and threat to me, a ghost under the canopy of leaves. And I'd been monstrous and mechanical to her, the sky elementally reconfigured into noise and terror. Now we could suddenly see each other's faces. We've been translated to each other. We sat at that small table where we could look into the eyes of all we had not known or had ignored or hated or feared and see instead reflection and revelation. See what Homer had seen when he once again retrieved that diary from the man he killed after it sat 36 year, in 36 years of darkness and opened his pages to reveal the precise drawings of a young man who wanted to be a healer. It was an instant when everything came together, not just because of where we'd been in a war, but because we'd both become writers after it. We understood at that moment when our stories had wrapped together, embodied in the latent power of stories to save our hearts by allowing us into the narrative of other human beings. What stories can do, Tim O'Brien writes, is make things present. I can look at things I never looked at. I can attach faces to grief and love and pity and God. I can be brave. I can make myself feel again. It was what Homer Steedley decided he needed to do. By refusing to let go of the notebooks he'd taken from Dom's body, Homer somehow understood, though he could not put it into words or coherent thoughts until years later, he was hanging on to a grief that was the price of remaining human. He needed to find and mourn what had been cut out of his heart. He needed to find Dom's story and his own story. I would say that Dom, I think, I think Ho said this, but Dom was a, a, a medic and in the notebook, he had put these meticulous drawings of, of you know, medical procedures because he didn't have a textbook with him or anything else. And just, you know, Homer looking at those drawings, of the man that he had killed, we had just seen his enemy moments before. Um, that that those drawings gave him Dom's story and made it made that person human to him. And it was that source of grief that he needed to deal with. Thank you, Ingwei. Um, I also remember Homo say telling a uh, the author of Wayne that uh, like uh, Wayne said. Homer had killed all the Vietnamese. However, that one left, never left him because not only they met face to face, but Homer made eye contact with them before them took his last breath. Imagine taking someone to life and then watching the man die, making his last view of Earth, of the world with your eyes. And that's the futility of war. And I also remember because I was the acting as the translator from the Dam family in Vietnam and Homer. Dam family actually did not resent Homer for killing their brother because the parents had already passed away after 40 years. They actually thank uh, Homer for preserving the artifacts. They did not know what had happened to the brother in the southern part of Vietnam. Uh, his body never came back and no news of him. He just was one of these MIAs. And there were some rumors in the village that maybe he had defected and had gone to the US. So when they received the artifact, which is basically not broken, some other pieces of papers and letters on, on the body, uh, that Dan gave back and Dan did not want to go back. He gave these artifacts to, to Wayne and Wayne brought it to the village, to the family first. 
the family invited, as I, I was in the middle of it because I did the translation of the letters back and forth. They invited Homer to come to Vietnam to meet them. And Homer was very leery. He was very concerned that I'm to kill her. I killed their brother. I don't want to meet them. He was very concerned. And he wrote back and he said, well, I'm an old man now. I'm not in good health. Um, so the family wrote back and said, don't worry, we take care of you. And if you're short of money, we send you the plane ticket. Can you imagine? Enemies become friends. Anyway, um, speaking of enemies and these veterans, these and at any one time during the mid, mid of the war, there was half a million American troops in Vietnam. Half a million. That many. So I know you grew up after the war had ended. And I myself had fought the US war in Vietnam. What was your impression of, of America? What was your impression of? American veteran whom you might have met in Vietnam or seen or read about. Can you talk about that? Um, so, you know, when I lived in Vietnam, I would not have imagined that one day I would be friends with Wayne. I would not have imagined that he would be one of my best friends ever. I was brought up to hate. Americans who were part of the war. I was brought up to believe that they were inhuman. They were only capable of killing us. I was brought up to be afraid of American soldiers because my parents were nearly killed many times by American bombs. And my father, my uncle, my own uncle fought against Wayne during the war. My own uncle fought for the Northern Vietnamese army. I remember when I first went to Washington, D.C., I think it was in the year 2009. I traveled with my husband and he took me to the uh, Vietnam Veteran Memorial. I refused to go in. I told my husband I could not go in to honor those who contributed regardless of how small to the death of three million Vietnamese people. I could not go in and I stood outside and I refused to go in, even though my, my husband resisted. And I, I, he went in and I stood outside and I was really upset. And then after half an hour, my husband went out and he took my hand gently and he said, if you don't go in, you are going to regret it because this site is so significant to you as a Vietnamese. Okay, so he, he pulled my hand and I followed him. And the first thing I noticed, there were so many letters at the foot of the wall. There were roses at the foot of the wall. And I pick up one of the letters and I read it and it was a letter that, that um, a son wrote to his dead father. I think until that moment, I did not think about American soldiers as human beings because I was brought up I was taught to believe that they were inhuman, you know? And if you believe that as a child, it was ingrained in you. So it, it only took that letter for me to realize the Americans that were part of the war in Vietnam, they were just like my uncle. Circumstances forced them to take part in that terrible war and American people lost so, so much. Every, every soldier who was there had their families with them. They suffered the same pain. And from that moment, I felt I was guilty all along of not discovering the humanity of American soldiers. You know what I did afterward? 
after what I started translating literature by, by American veterans, like Bruce Weigel, like, um, I didn't know when at that time, but I translated the work of Larry Heinemann. I, I was an interpreter for a lot of conferences that, that brought American uh, veterans back to Vietnam. And I, I thought it was really meaningful for me to show Vietnamese people the human side of American soldiers because we needed to do that. Both sides, you know, not just, not just Vietnamese, but American people need to see the human side of Vietnamese too. I remember some, some um, veterans told me that when on one of the veterans told me that on the land going to Vietnam, he was told by his um, his commander, don't, don't worry about killing Vietnamese. They are different than us. They've been at war for thousands of years. They don't love their family members the way we love our family members. You know, so I think in any war, the tendency is to dehumanize the other side so it's easier to kill them. And I think my experience at the war changed all that. And from that moment, it changed me as a writer. As a writer, I wanted to write for peace. I did, I did not want to write for hate. I did not want to promote hatred and violence. From that moment, I made a commitment that whenever I can still write, I would write for peace. I would write to bring humans together because I don't know why we keep fighting, we keep causing death and, and injuries to each other. And you know, we exist on this earth for a purpose. We all, all are children of Mother Earth. We, the pandemic has shown us we depend on each other, right? We are connected to each other regardless of our nationality, regardless of where we are. We are connected one one trouble in one part of the world will, will affect the other parts. So we need to work with each other better as a human race. So, um, yeah, so like Professor Ho said, you know, I've been writing for peace for so many years and I'm, I'm, I'm just, just so honored that I'm here today talking about peace with you. I believe you, the younger generation, are our future. You build the future, you will make changes. Our world is so rotten. Our world has so many problems, but we cannot be despair. We need to have hope. And I have, I really hope that you will would work with us in making changes, in bringing all human beings together. Well, I did not know that when I felt the same thing about visiting the Vietnam Veteran War Memorial in Washington, D.C., like I did, we did not discuss it, but I resisted. I, I was not able to see it for 20 years until 2002, when I took a group, a group of my students to Vietnam. I wanted them to see how Vietnamese remember the war dead. And it was only in fairness to myself and to my students that I would take them to see the Vietnam Veteran War Memorial. So I went with my student for support. Anyway, but coming from that first visit to the war, uh, when I wrote a poem in Vietnamese about her experience there, I would ask her to read that now. And also I ask uh, Professor Carlin of Wayne to read the English. Art, page 118 and 119. So after the visit, it took me many years before I can write this poem. Bức tường chiến tranh Việt Nam Tiếng chim gõ vào nhà trắng Nụ cười linh côn âm vang Hoàng hôn đọc bạch Washington Bức tường đen, 58.267 cái tên không quen biết, 58.267 tên người đã nã súng vào trí nhớ tôi, 
mũi dày họ còn loang vết máu tôi muốn chôn họ thêm lần nữa chất độc da cam rực lên màu lửa phan thị kim phúc bốc cháy băng qua những hàng tên lặng câm đen lặng câm cu trả lời cho nghìn câu hỏi chợt một đóa hồng nhỏ thắt lên đau nhói bức thư nhòa lệ của một người sống còn sống viết cho một cái tên đã chết cha ơi hôm nay là ngày sinh nhật con gái con ước gì cha ở đây để cùng cháu thổi nến mừng tuổi mới không ngày nào con không nghĩ đến cha tại sao cha ơi tại sao cha phải đến việt nam tại sao cha phải chết những cánh hồng héo quắt những bức thư giải thảm dưới chân tường những con chữ chập chờn rỉ máu tôi nghe từ trong lòng đất âm u hình thù của những người cha mỹ bé những đứa con thơ hốc mắt họ quần sâu hấu hấu bom trái tim loang lỗ vết đạt chất độc da cam đẫm vào người họ dòng máu chảy loang kéo trôi những đứa con đang khét gào khỏi đôi tay từng cái tên trên bức tường đen chìm vào tôi thành từng khuôn mặt của mỗi 58.267 cái tên đã chết đỏ quạch Washington chiều nay hoàng hôn hay nước mắt There's a reference in here to uh, Auntie Kim Phuc. I'll read that footnote also. She's a child subject of a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph taken during the Vietnam War, June 8th, 1972 by photographer Nick Ut. Photo showed her running naked and crying after being severely burned by, by napalm. And, and the photograph was very widely seen in everywhere in the world, particularly in the United States after, after the, uh, during and after the war. Um, I, I'll say other, one other thing. I, I you hear, I, I'm sure you hear the, the musicality in the, in the Vietnamese. Uh, it's a tonal language and listening to it, wh whether it's sung or not, I mean, it sounds sung. And one of the things I think that, that Quay Mai accomplished beautifully in the book and writing in English, you still get the kind of musicality of, of the Vietnamese to the way she puts proverbs in and, the, and just the way she uses the English, you, you still get that, that tone. And it's prose, but it, but it comes across very much as, as, uh, as poetry. So Vietnam Veterans Memorial, birds songs knocks on the White House. Lincoln's smile resounds, sunset soaks Washington in deep red. The black wall, 58,267 names I don't know, who fired gunshots into my mind, their boot tips still drenched with blood. I want to bury them once more. Agent Orange flares up its color and the burning Pham Ti Kim Phu runs out from the rows of names. Black, silent the silent answer for thousands of questions. A tiny rose lights up a sharp pain. A letter dim with tears that someone wrote for his dead father. Father, today is my daughter's birthday. I wish she were here. Blow out her birthday candles. There isn't a day that goes by without me thinking about you. Why, Father? Why did you have to go to Vietnam? Why did you have to die? The rose petals wilt. Letters carpet below the black wall. Their words flicker and bleed. I hear from the gloomy earth the sounds of American fathers carrying their babies in their arms, their eye sockets like bomb craters, their hearts bullet holes. Agent Orange lives in their bodies. Their blood flows and drags their crying babies from their arms. Every name on the black wall sinks into my skin to become each face of the fallen Americans, Washington this afternoon, red sunset or tears. Anyway, 
Uh, I, I will ask a win one question and I go back to you. <laughs> because uh, we have students in this classroom now, you must be between 18, 19, 20 or so. You're young people. That was the age that uh, Wayne had enlisted in the Marines in the mid 60s to go to Vietnam to take up the gun. He, I believe, was a helicopter dog gunner. <laughs> okay. I only imagine that. I'm a pacifist. I don't touch a gun. But anyway, and yet you come back, you become who you are now. What happened in Vietnam to you? It's a big question. So it may happen to you too, and you have to search yourself. Do I want to do this or not? Let's hear from him who will be through that. When I went, I, I believed that we were going to fight to help other people uh, maintain, maintain their freedom. Um, I also went because um, I come from a family uh, who were refugees from Europe and who were saved by this country. And I felt I owed this country um, that, that service. Um, what I found in the war though, was that rather than, rather than saving the country, we were destroying it that there was a prevalent attitude of, you know, of, of racism towards the Vietnamese and that it was resulting in um, many, many civilian deaths. Uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll make it short. I mean, basically I found that we, by being there, we were harming and even destroying this country and I could not stand to be a part of that. So when I came back, I spoke out against it, you know, as, as, as an American who loves my country. Uh, of course, I felt and I still feel my country should be doing uh, good in the world. Not, not that. Uh, and that. And that's what changed. So. I, I must say that um, the war could not have ended without people like Wayne. I think the veterans who were part of the war first, who came back and started all of these demonstrations, all of this campaign, you know, against the war was really important for us to end, for the war to be ended. So thank you, Wayne. You know, thank you for your honesty, for speaking the truth, because I think uh, that requires a, a lot of courage. And, and you know, um, what I have is the utmost respect for you, for what you have done for us for your friendship. I mean, you know, I knew about Wayne before I met him. You know, so many writers in Vietnam talk about Wayne because he dedicated so many years of his life to translating and publishing the Vietnamese writer's work. And he put it, he prioritized it above his own work. And it was really difficult in the beginning, you know, to publish work of, um, of, of, uh, of veterans, work of Vietnamese writers. And when really fought really hard to have Vietnamese voices heard. And, you know, he's one of the writers who gives a lot of space for Vietnamese people in his work. Because normally, there, there have been a lot of um, literature in English about Vietnam. But normally, we appear as background to the American stories. But if you read Wang's stories, you know, he plays Vietnamese people on the equal level with Americans. So for this book, you know, for example, Wandering Soul, both, um, both them and Homer, you know, appear, they are equals, they have equal spaces to tell their own stories and they appear as human beings, as full human beings. And, and Wayne has done it really well. And, and thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Okay, when I, uh, let's go back to your, to your award prize winning mountains, the mountain sing, uh, which if you haven't had a chance, you should read one day and I guarantee you will cry. Anyway, what is it that you, when you write, you have the readership in mind. 
what is it that you want the readers to get from this? Not, not just like Tom Clancy, which has now a team of writers producing, really producing, not creating anymore, so that there would, could be more money coming in. What, it's not your goal. What do you want readers, American, Vietnamese, Vietnamese American, Vietnamese in Vietnam. What what do you want them to get from your story? I think when I started writing this book, I did not think about readers. I wrote this book to comprehend the history of Vietnam. I wrote this book to understand better my family history and the experiences of those around me. I was compelled to write the book so that the stories I heard and I witnessed could not be forgotten. So much that has happened to Vietnamese people, but not a lot have been recorded. For example, stories about the great hunger, the land reform, the conflict between Northern and Southern Vietnam, uh, the issues of reconciliations that need to be resolved. They are still unspoken about. Trauma and PTSD by Vietnamese people are not normally spoken about because it's a taboo subject. Officially, we won the war. So there's no trauma. That's the official uh, position, right? So, so I, I wanted to honor the experiences of those who, who lived before me and those who told me their personal stories. So I was, right, was compelled to write this book. And I think the second reason was that I wanted to decolonize literature about Vietnam. So many books have been written about Vietnam, but normally it's from the Western viewpoint. And Vietnamese from inside Vietnam, Vietnamese women rarely have the chance to tell our own stories. Normally, you know, if you uh, watch Hollywood movies about Vietnam, Vietnamese women often appear as prostitutes, as those who don't have a voice, as those who need to be rescued by men. And you know, my experiences growing up in Vietnam really told me that Vietnamese women are stronger than that. We are pillars of our society, of, of our families. And during wartime, Vietnamese women were actually those who had to heal the men who came back from the war really traumatized. So I, I wanted to, to write about the Vietnam. I know the Vietnam, not just as a war, but a Vietnam full of of complexity, of color, of beautiful poetry, of, of, of language, of proverbs, of, uh, you know, of, uh, of really complex relationships among family members. So in this book, I wanted to write against the image of Vietnam as a war. I wanted to write about Vietnam as a culture, as, as, a, as a people who have gone through so much, but who never, ever give up hope. If you go to Vietnam, one of the things you witness is the sense of, uh, of energy. People are really hardworking and they, they look forward to the future. If you go to Hanoi and Saigon, cities never sleep. You know, there are street sellers who are there selling things at four, three o'clock in the morning. People work around the clock because they never give up. They work towards a better future. And I wanted to show that sense of hope in, in, in this book, you know, I don't want to show Vietnamese as victims that need, who need to be rescued. I want to show us as a country who look forward and who need to heal. I put Vietnamese people in the center of, of this novel because we need to be in the center of the Vietnam War. I mean, with due respect. Vietnamese people suffer so much. Three million Vietnamese died and millions still suffer from unexploded ordinance, millions still suffer from the impact of Agent Orange. You know that until today, babies are still born deformed in Vietnam. So I bring issues of Agent Orange into this book, issues which are still very relevant today. And another thing is that, you know, Vietnamese people who fought from opposite sides haven't forgiven each other. There's still a lot of resentment among our community, a lot of um, a lot of conflicting emotions and issues. And I wanted us to talk about these issues because it's important for us, for Vietnamese people, to forgive each other so that we can come together as one one group of people again. Uh, 
Um, I should now open up the floor for any question that comes from any of you. Actually, I was wondering if you could read uh, maybe a, a, an excerpt from, from the book for us before we ask those questions. I, I, would, okay. I would love to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if you would like to, while well, you've written it in English, but yes, I, I, I love hearing the, the, the language. So I don't know if you want to. Thank wanna... you. Okay, I will read something. Okay. So um, this novel is told in two uh, viewpoints. <coughs> and the first viewpoint is the grandmother, and the second viewpoint is the granddaughter, and her name is Hung, and Hung's parents had gone to war. So now Hung is reflecting on how she missed her parents. I miss my parents dearly. During the years that she was gone, I imagined seeing my mother again every day. I imagined disappearing into her embrace, into the river of her hair, into her soft breast. I imagined our voices rising like kites from under the shade of our new bound tree. I miss how my mother had filled our home with her singing voice how gracefully she had danced, how she had led me along by my fingers, twirling me around so my shirt would flare. Whenever I was sad, I told myself to be strong like my mother. She never cried or showed fear. Once we found a snake under our bed, and while I stood there shaking, she bent and picked it up by the tip of its tail flinging it out of the open window. By the beginning of 1975, rumors spread that the war was really ending, and I imagined my mother flying me down the streets of Hanoi on the back of grandma's bicycle. We would scream at the top of our lungs as the bike rushed us into a brilliant summer, into red fruit flowers, into purple bang lang petals that blossomed above pavements punctured by bomb shelters. We would stop at the leg of the returned sword, delighting at the delirious coldness of Chang Tian ice cream. In my dreams, my mother always returned with my father. He was tall and handsome. Sometimes he would rush towards me on his two feet. Sometimes he struggled on a single leg, leaning on a crutch. Sometimes he embraced me with his two strong arms. And at other times, he had no arms at all, just two lumps of soft flesh protruding from his shoulders. But he always laughed as he called my name. Here is Hương, my daughter. How much time do we have? Five minutes? No, on the phone. I'm not sure. No webinar. We don't have any. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, last night, I because I know I had to do this today, which is a pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you both for trusting me to be sitting here next to you. I am just an ordinary college teacher and 35 years in this country, five years in Canada. But anyway, but it's a privilege to be sitting here. So last night I was reading the reviews on Amazon of a famous book and over 2,400 reviews that I, I don't with reviews that much, but that's quite a few. Uh, some of whom say that she should be receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for literature, for a prize in literature. And that would be so wonderful. And you and I would be so privileged to know her since the day before. <laughs> anyway, uh, some people had said that, you know, the novel moved them so much. 
and they wanted to know more about the family, so they were hoping that she would write a sequel to this book. So I guess as a writer, you're very passionate. You want to write. Will there be a sequel or will there be another book of some kind coming? Thank you. you. Want to talk about Thank that? you. You are so kind. Um, so actually, um, there have been readers who wanted to have a sequel because, you know, this book um, did not have the ending. You, you don't find all the answers to the questions you have when you read it. There are, there are things which are still open and uh, there are things that happen to some members of the family and the readers will find out. Anyway, um, at the moment, I have no plan for a sequel, but I finished the second novel in English called Last Child. It's about Amerasians, children of American soldiers and Vietnamese women uh, born and abandoned during the war. So during the Vietnam War, there were like two and a half million Americans who were present in Vietnam. And many of them had relationships with Vietnamese women and gave birth, you know, and, and out of the relationships, about 100,000 of children were born and they suffered a lot of discrimination, especially, uh, you know, uh, Black Amerasians. So one of my, uh, the characters in my book is a Black Amerasian and he faced a lot of discrimination in, in Vietnam. Um, so I think uh, Amerasians and their family members have gone through a lot and they are the victims of, of the Vietnam War. And I feel like, you know, um, as a journalist, I, I interviewed Amerasians and their family members, and I actually helped some people find each other after, after 40, 60, 45 years and after, six, uh, after more than 50 years. It was unbelievable, the real life stories, and I felt like, you know, um, I, I had to write something about them. So I'm, I'm really excited about this book and it kept me also uh, sleepless for many nights. So it took me seven years to write The Mountain Sing and almost the same time now with the second novel. And when I uh, read it and when helped me a lot actually, because you know, in that second novel, I challenged myself by writing in the viewpoint of an American veteran <laughs> who returns to Vietnam. So here I am writing English as a second language, but in the viewpoint of an American man. So, um, so you know, I, um, I, I gave the manuscript to Wayne and he really he kindly read it and, and gave me comments that was amazing. So I can't wait for you to read this book as well. Thank you. I know I'm not the speaker, I'm the moderator, but I cannot help when I listen to Quay Mai and Wayne talking that I, I can share some personal experiences. Yes. You said that uh, when you grew up as a young child, young girl, that you were afraid of uh, American soldier, white people. Well, I'm, um, I'm also older, so father. So I'm a, of a different generation. Growing up in Northern Vietnam during the French colonial era. And I read, no one taught me, my parents did not tell me to fear. They did not teach me to fear, but automatically, later on in life, when I saw white people in Vietnam, I would cross the street because I was so afraid of them. Because the only white people I know are people who look like him, like him, like you, and they always have the gun, and they have the power to kill Vietnamese. No question asked. You can be 18, you can be from Tennessee, you can be from Iowa, you can be from Southern Maryland, but when you go to Vietnam, you have you are licensed to kill. And I was on the receiving end, so automatically I would fear them, I would avoid them. It took me years to overcome that, like you did. And now my best friends, I didn't pick them, I have rainbow friends, including white people. <laughs> And I don't really know why I identify them as why they're just people that I realized that, you know, we are no different. So that's what struck me. Uh, and also my own mother survived the uh, land reform. Uh, we have to escape, as in the book about this uh, imaginary grandmother she wrote about, who had to escape with her children. 
my mother and us children had to escape because her village was taken over by the Vietnamese or the Vietnamese communists, and they would have killed her because she was a small landowner. And that was enough of a crime to be executed, to be given a kangaroo trial, and then she would be executed. My father was not in Vietnam at the time because of the war, he had to leave in 1950. So my mother had to raise nine children on her own during the war. So, so that, that book, uh, the mountain sing really, you know, was so close to home. It's like she did in the with me. How, how, where did she get that story? It's my story. Anyway, question? Yeah, I'd love to hear your questions. We are here for you. <laughs> we have been speaking too much. <laughs> and it's a broad question for both of you. But since both of your these novels were discussing of Wayne's and, and the Mount Singh, one of the themes is reconciliation and, and peace and bringing that out, the humanization of the people across the aisle, which of course is a lesson we all need right now, but what place do you think that has actually in our diplomacy? You know I mean, with, these issues are constant. They're, they're, mankind doesn't seem to be learning from our, our, past, our past errors, but more and more people finding these, these outlets surely should have some effect. Can you see a place for that? Can you see a, a platform that you'd be you know, obviously you speak preaching to the converted in a room like this, but you understand what I'm trying to ask. Where would you put your work forward to bring about some change that you're obviously trying to achieve through writing? I, I can't, I, I, if I start thinking about, you know, this is going to affect uh, foreign policy. This is going to affect diplomats. This is going to affect uh, anybody making that policy. I, I would just get too pessimistic to, con to continue working. So, I mean, I think as, as a writer, as a writer of fiction, what I, what I hope to do is to, is to affect the, the, the hearts, the minds, the souls of individuals. And, and I think that's all I can do. And if some of those individuals you know, if they learn something and if that affects other people, then then that, then that's good. But it's a, it's a it's a private connection between myself and, and the individual. I'm 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 not. You know, having seen the way the world didn't change since I was in Vietnam in the war and then came back, having seen all the ways it did not change, if I start if I start thinking about that, I would just you know, give up. Say okay, everything we did. No, we're still we're still going to other kind. We're still we're still involved in these wars, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's not it. As a writer, I just have to do what I can do uh, to affect individuals. I also uh, was thinking about the same thing. I think uh, you know when a reader read the book, like like Wayne's and mine, they have to be vulnerable. They have to to be part of the story. And I think in a way. I hope they've changed some way, uh, you know, in, in, their, in their understanding of the war and the things that we all need to do. But I think, you know, with, with our, the publication of our work, uh, we have had the chance to, to be involved in a lot of useful discussion with younger people or also with veterans, you know, of different sides. And I think these dialogues are really important. I think. For me, you know, I have been able to reach out to Vietnamese communities in different places. And I can share you with you that, you know, many Vietnamese Americans have told me it was really hard to read my novel first because the beginning chapters are all from the, from someone, from the a family from Northern Vietnam. And most Vietnamese in the U.S. are from Southern Vietnam, you know, so they don't want they don't normally read uh, the, from the viewpoint of people from the north, north of Vietnam. So I think, you know, by, by uh, encouraging 
teaching them to accept, to be open to the stories from the other side, I think reconciliation starts that from that point. Thank you. And Linda is my dear friend. We've known each other many years from Bangladesh, right? And we haven't seen each other for years, so it's amazing that she is here today. Thank you. It's great I mentioned the, the, the friction, the tension still that exists among Vietnamese communities, the overseas Vietnamese, the Vietnamese in Vietnam, and within Vietnam, the Northern Vietnamese and the Southern Vietnamese, there's still too much tension. After nearly 50 years of uh, peace, but uh, this is an issue that's uh, ongoing everywhere, universal. Is in West Germany still have that same kind of tension? And look, our civil war, the American US civil war ended in 16, 1865. Over a century and a half later, there's still that tension north and south. And then look at the Korean, the North and South Korea, they won't have an, they would kill each other if they could. So so this is to be expected. Perhaps we should not be too pessimistic. There's still hope. Hope that there are people here sitting that would have killed each other back then or fear each other at least. Oh, thank you. And uh, I hope to hear the, from the students. And also, we have people participating on the Zoom. Uh, um, on Zoom, I want to say hello and thank you for being a part of our discussion today. And we hope to receive questions from you too. Thank you. Students, questions? Yes, please. This is new for like all of you guys, but. Um, Can you remove your mask so to get yeah. Um. How, like, I hope this isn't like too personal, but how did you guys like help yourselves with PTSD from the war? It'd be very different causes for yeah. uh, any trauma that, that we might, might have had and I might have had. But uh, for me, it was by becoming a writer and also by, uh, by being engaged in, in, the, in the kind of uh, veterans anti-war work. That I did. So I think with any, when you talk about trauma, you have to think about, um, first of all, confronting what caused the trauma, being able to articulate that. And then I think the real healing comes from trying to make something good out of that. Uh, so that for me, that, that was, that was the, the pattern, I, th I think, that, uh, that saved me, you know, being able to write and being able to you know, have, have people read my writing, but also to try to work in, in the ways that, uh, that I've tried to work in. Yeah, I also, um, I mean, as, as a writer who write about, who writes about PTSD and trauma, I, it's really hard because you have to feel what your characters feel, and we chose really tough topics, you know? So I, so I think, I agree completely with what Wen said, and and Wen and I have been discussing about the need to communalize our trauma, to feel that we are not alone. So for a traumatized people, uh, you know, healing is not possible if the person buries the trauma. So if if the person opens up him or herself up to be able to talk or write about it, to communalize it, to know that the person is not alone, but to be part of the community is really helpful. Thank you. I know of a personal friend whose son went and fought in Afghanistan. Young man was in his early 20s. He came back. Whatever happened in Afghanistan, it was a normal young man from Southern Maryland, St. Mary's County. He came back and committed suicide. We are very sure that was his failure to deal with PTSD, the lack of help. We send our young men to kill. We don't help them to return to normalcy. We don't do enough. There's, there's, the statistics now is there's 22 veterans every day who are committing suicide. 22 will mention that. Which is amazing statistics. Any other questions? 
the young man in the back, and then the next two up here. Okay, so I actually have two questions. Uh, Louder, please. When you're 75, you know. <laughs> okay, so I actually have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is for Kwai Mai. Uh, you wrote a poem called With a Vietnam Veteran, and it kind of like tells a story about someone going to meet an American veteran in a restaurant of sorts. Uh, who did you write that about? Because like, it kind of felt like you were you were kind of the woman who was meeting the, the, the American veteran. Oh, thank you so much for reading my work. Um, so with the Vietnam veteran is uh, for Bruce Weiger, my co-translator of um, of, uh, of this uh, poetry collection. So it happened, you know, my poetry is like, um, my poetry captures moments of my life. So I remember I was in a restaurant with Bruce Weiger and there was um, on TV, the TV was showing the war in Afghanistan. And he was like, he looked away and he told the people to turn the TV off. And I realized that because he's still traumatized by the Vietnam War and when he saw the fighting scenes from another war, you know, he was, he, he, his trauma was provoked. But I was thinking how close we are. Normally we think, okay, Afghanistan is far away from us. But actually it's just so close to us. It could be us. We could our normal life could be dropped away any minute, you know, so peace is so fragile. So I was uh, writing about that in that moment and reflecting about, uh, about uh, you know, how fragile peace is and, and also the relationship between, between these American veterans and Vietnam and how they return, you know, because I, I was, I was thinking, uh, writing about him eating, you know, uh, Vietnamese food in, in the tropical heat of Vietnam and how much he sweat. And I think it's amazing that veterans like Wen or like Bruce feel like, uh, they, I, I think by being back to Vietnam, you feel some positive energy, right? I think Bruce always tells me that he feels better when he goes back to Vietnam. To see the country at peace, you know, to see, I mean, I think we always look at it with the filter behind the present day, there's, there's always the past. Yes. And to see the way the present day, the way the peace, that's, you know, is there now. I mean, people aren't shooting, they're not killing each other. It's, it's, and we yeah, make the friendship, time. making that friendship, um, which, is, which is the essence of peace. Really, it, it's a healing. It's a healing experience, and, and you know, thousands of American veterans who've gone back have, have had that experience, feeling it. You know, you it's it's the same way you deal with trauma. I mean, you have to go back to the cause, and then change it. Next question: The person in front, then I take the one. I think he had a another question. You had two, right? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, this is kind of more of a question for both uh, Kwe Mai and uh, Mr. Harlan. Um, but you both uh, write with the intention of push pushing a message of reconciliation between uh, the Vietnamese people and the American people. Uh, do you think that your writing has pushed the needle forward uh, for, that, for that goal? I, th I think so. I mean, I think Quinn might kind of answer that with uh, Lynn's question also. Um, it's it's pushed it forward in that you know people read this and and they're changed even a little bit. You know that, that there's a quote in in the Mountain Sing from Huang, the the uh, girl whose story is being told. Uh, if if we read each other's stories, um, there there can no longer be war. I'm, par I'm paraphrasing that. So much. So I think, and yeah, I mean that's that's what we hope for as writers that that's that's pushing forward. And I think um, there's other work that comes out of it. We talked about the the damage that's still in Vietnam from unexploded ordnance from Agent Orange, and there are many veterans group working to um, to deal with that. You know, to to fund the efforts to um, clear the land of unexploded ordnance of Agent Orange, 
to build schools, to build clinics and so on. So I, yeah, I, I think it's, I think there is that kind of ripple effect from, from the stories. Thank you. Thank you. We better take the next question. The lady, or you have a mask on, please. That you, yes. Oh, and, then, um, and then you will be next. So my question is for Kwe Mai. Um, it is, what do you feel you've learned about yourself and your connection to Vietnamese culture while you wrote The Mountain Sing? Oh, thank you. That's a, an amazing question. I think with the process, you know, during the seven years of writing this book, I discovered so much about myself. I think um, in the process of writing, you discover your, your values, your beliefs, you know, which you don't normally think about. So actually, one of the, the, the purposes of me writing this book is to take revenge. So my uh, grandmother was killed in the Great Hunger by someone who tied her to corn plants. So I named the man wicked ghost in the book and I wanted to revenge. I wanted to, with my fiction, to do many, many bad things to him and his family. But in the end, I found forgiveness instead, you know? Um, and, and, and so that's one of the things I found about myself. And I was also, because when I wrote about Vietnam and because I, I, have, I was writing this book when I was far away from Vietnam, I started writing it when I was in the Philippines and I wrote it in Belgium and I finished it in Indonesia. So being away from home, a way for me to return home is to bring Vietnamese alive. So I, you know, I, I had to reflect on our culture. I was thinking about how to describe food <laughs> so that, you know, I brought it alive so I could almost taste the food, hear the language, listen to the proverbs and the poetry. So I, so I think, you know, in writing a book, you need to research a lot, you know. So for example, I researched about traditional medicine. Uh, I, I wrote about the use of traditional medicine as, as a healing uh, source during the war because the Vietnamese doctors uh, from, from Northern Vietnam didn't have a lot of medicine. So they had to use, uh, you know, nature for, kill, uh, for, for helping the soldiers. So I researched, I asked, uh, I, I interviewed a lot of traditional doctors. So I, I learned a lot from this book. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next question, please. Hello. Uh, okay. Um, is it overwhelming writing about the traumas of war, both from interviewing people and actually like being there and experiencing it? I think that's true. Let, let me re repeat the question. I'm not sure if the voices from the audience get heard um, as well. So on Zoom. On, on Zoom. So is it is it overwhelming writing about the trauma of war? Yes. And experiencing it. I I want you to answer that too. But I think um, as I said before, it's both it's both painful and healing. Because if you're going to if you're going to do it honestly, if you're going to do it in the way that Kwe Mai just described. You have you have you have to get deeply into your into your own heart, and deeply also because you know in, into thinking about the experiences of other people who might have gone through the same or gone through worse things than than, than you've gone through. So it's it's like when if you go to a hospital, you know you go to a cancer ward, you're going to see people, and that's going and that's going to be painful to see. And, and writing, creating characters, or or even writing nonfiction about that, it kind of multiplies. You know, whatever happened to me personally is kind of multiplied by by all the other people that I have to inhabit in 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 doing that kind of writing. So yes, but at the same time, it's it's following the the sort of arc of recovery because it is being told, it is being communalized. You read that. And then my experience and the experience of those people, if I succeed in getting their stories, right, that becomes somewhat a part of your experience too. You know, there's no, there's, it's, there's a bridge between us, not a, not a gap, right? And that, and that's, a, that's a healing thing. And um, I like to add that, um, I mean, I agree with what uh, Professor Kalim said. 
And I think as a writer who write about PTSD and trauma, we need to take care of ourselves. Self-care is really important in any job, but as a writer, I think it's even more important because it's a lonely job. You're not communicating, you know, you, you by yourself by in the room and you write all day. So I think, I, you know, for me personally, it's important to do exercise, take walks every day, you know, and also um, exercise. Uh, when, when it comes to researching about PTSD and trauma, PTSD and trauma I, I have learned during my PhD research to apply ethical principles. Because when you uh, interview the traumatized people, it's really important. You could provoke their trauma. So you 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 know you, you could ask a question that, that make them believe the experiences. So you need to design uh, you know uh, your research which protect your research participants. And I was really grateful I could learn that as part of my PhD from the design to choosing the participants to the type of questions. And I think there are certain, uh, you know, so in, in some areas, I did not interview people. I relied on secondary research on things which are already out there because you don't need to ask people and, and make them relieve all these things. You have to protect it, uh, protect the people. And, and your writing, I think as one thing I don't think we, we talk about enough is like uh, how to protect the you know, like one of the things I learned during my PhD as part of the ethical um, principle of my writing is to protect my research participants when it comes to issues which, which are very personal to them because writing can harm people, writing can kill, writing can damage people's lives. And what responsibilities we as writers have towards other people around us towards our family members, towards our friends, because like it could be easy for us to take somebody else's story and, 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 and sensationalize it, right? But I think we as human beings, we have to be responsible towards each other. And writers have that responsibility to be respectful towards those around them. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Rachel mentioned at the beginning that there was a, a question about um, what what you read that made you cry. Was that the, the That's wording? One of, one of my students. <laughs> so I'm I'm asking for whoever that's. So um, I think um, I I don't remember uh, crying from reading uh, the some of the first books that I read, I just remember the joy of reading. I remember because, you know, I was very obedient. I, as a child growing up in Vietnam, you know, in a poor family who had, I, I felt compelled to, to obey my parents because I believed that they sacrificed their whole life for us, my two brothers and I, which they, they did. So I, I did everything I was told. And then I read this story called um, Zen Man Fuluki, uh, Diaries of a Cricket, which I wrote about in this book. And I was like, it was um, freeing for me because in that book, this cricket made all types of trouble. <laughs> he left his home, he made all types of troubles, he had all the wrong friends. He had so many mistakes. So then in the end, when he returned home, he was more mature, a better person because he, he dared to make mistakes. He dared to take risks. And I felt I was too obedient at that time. So it was liberating to read that story, you know? So I dreamt of, of, of being wild, of being disobedient, of, of, of you know, of, of being uh, non-Vietnamese. <laughs> when I read that book and I you know um, so I I remember this was one of the first book that really influenced my character are, are there questions from the audience on zoom I think you've already mostly comments okay and, and one that you've already kind of answered oh, okay. the two of you thank you right now it's mostly for way my somewhat but your experiences with uh, Agent Orange, 
now it's uh, effective, affected you, and uh, what's made you write about it, the horror of it, what made you uh, write uh, about it in more than one of your poem, poems, how has that uh, made you write about it, not only about the whole, yeah, I don't know how I would word that better. Yeah, uh, thank you for that important question. I, I, I wrote about Agent Orange recently on the New York Times uh, because I was really upset uh, that, um, that, the, uh, that the court case of this uh, Vietnamese woman, this is uh, Tô Nga, she was trying to sue American, uh, the manufacturers of Agent Orange who uh, made so much profit from the production of Agent Orange and the sale of the chemical and who has done nothing for the pe for millions of people in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. So I so I, I, I wrote about it and I, I remember, you know, from my childhood having to eat deformed fish, fish that was deformed by Agent Orange. And I, I, I recall uh, volunteering in an, at an orphanage. And one day I was, this orphanage was for, uh, children who were disabled because Agent Orange. And one day I was leaving the orphanage and one mother, one woman uh, held my hand. And then she told me her son was in the orphanage. Her husband had fought in the war and died of Agent Orange and her son was highly disabled. So she worked as a, um, a street cleaner. She did not uh, have enough money to hire someone to take care of the son who needed 24 hours care. So she had to give the son up to the orphanage. So she asked me, do you know how I feel as a mother who has to give the child away, who is unable to take care of the child? Do you know how I feel every day? And she, she went to the orphanage every weekend to bath her son and feed him, but otherwise she could not do much, you know. And I reflect on the pain of all of the parents who have children who are deformed because of Asian orange and so many people still in today in Vietnam who have to live with the consequences of, of Asian orange and they haven't been compensated. <coughs> um, so it, it's really unfair and, and you know, it's... Um, so I was compelled to write about it because I wanted these people not to be forgotten. We are not talking about a small number of people. We're talking about millions of people, the people who are the most desperate, the most poor. So if you visit Vietnam, I was talking about, you know, it being so nice to visit Vietnam, but there is one uh, museum in Saigon called, uh, called um, War Remnants Museum. If you go in there, you see glass jars with baby fetus. Babies born deformed and dead because they should know it. And, and, and if you visit orphanages, you will see children who don't look like human beings, who, who have had, you know, two, three sizes, uh, three, uh, two, twice or three times the size of a normal human head. Oh, oh, oh. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, I think it's unspeakable that we don't do more to help these people who desperately need our help. And I think the saddest thing is that we move from one world to the next. We forget about what we, we, we've just done. We move on to other war and we don't learn the lessons. Who are we? The, we as the human race, I, I, I think, you know, like uh, military, you know, it's the government who start the war. But I think all of us somehow are responsible. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm responsible for not doing it now. I feel like every day I feel like I should do more for all the Vietnamese. I am in a position to do more. Yet I move on with my life and sometimes I pretend these things don't exist. And, and this is wrong because we are in this together. Actually, that, that's a perfect um, 
segue into a, I do have a question that just came in from an anonymous attendee uh, that says, is there any particular message you want people from younger generations that don't have any personal connections to war to get from your work? And that's a question for both of you. Like, well, I'll take off from what Kwe Mai just said, which is first of all, the, the idea of, of uh, individual responsibility, you know, that we are all part of something together. Uh, I, when I went to the, to the war at uh, 19 years of age, um, I, I knew nothing about what I was getting into. I had some notions that were given to me, but, but I knew I do nothing. And that attitude cost my generation and my country um, thousands of lives and thousands you know, more uh, people being damaged. So that I, what I hope people get out of, get out of this, besides, besides you know, very importantly, the need to read each other and, and, to, and to read the stories and to know the literature and to humanize each other you know, in that way, um, is also this idea that we are we are all responsible for ourselves first of all to to learn enough to know enough you know to make to make choice it doesn't matter if you're 19 years old or not you're still going to be making choices all along and for me for war whatever choices you're going to make that are going to affect you the rest of your life and you need to understand the world as much as you can. And, and, and as best you can, and you need to understand that this is, you know, this this is your responsibility, and your responsibility is also other people. And just what what Kwe Mai was was speaking about, that we are we are. Uh, I mean, I, I love the answer that you just gave to to Ho, who's we. You know, we it, it is humanity. Not, we're not doing this as only as Americans, only as whatever whatever we're talking about. It's, this this is the human race. This is what we're all part of. We're all responsible for each other, and we're all responsible uh, for the damage that we we do to each other to prevent it, to heal it, you know, to go forward. Thank you, Wayne. Amazing answer. Um, I have a question. I mean, uh, I think the question is uh, what we hope the younger generations you know, can get from our work. I think, like I said before, I believe the younger generations are our hope, our future, and we have a lot of hope in you. I really hope that we read each other and we empathize with each other so there is no other, you know, that, that all races, all nationalities, all religions are equal and, and we respect each other and in that only with that we can build a foundation of peace from respect and communications and I really hope like like Gwen said, you know, we take care of each other, take care of our family, but also take care of the, the, the community, you know, of, of the global community as well. And, and, and do more for other people in all the disadvantaged situations. Thank you. I'll just make one comment. It's, first of all, thank you. Thank you all very much, Wayne, for reminding us of how stories, words can change people. Um, and the extent to which we can expose students to that reality, you've helped us with that today. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. I, I actually, if, uh, I don't know if you want to keep going or if, this, if you want this to be the, the last question, it's up to if anyone else has a question, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it because I want to know. And I think that uh, those listening and my students would probably be curious too, but Veterans Day is Thursday. And, um, you know, sometimes as a culture, we, uh, we think we're doing good 
by celebrating or saying happy Veterans Day or thank you for your service or, and we might not know the right way to have a conversation uh, for such an important uh, observance. So I'm just wondering how, what you both think of observing uh, Veterans Day and some maybe uh, experiences that you've had with, with it. The, one, one of the things that came out of um, the perception of the Vietnam War was since the 1990s, since we started getting involved in, in the Middle East as well, was the idea of, of saying to veterans, thank you for your service. And that's, and that's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a nice impulse it's to say, you know, we appreciate you, et cetera. But it, it's often to a lot of veterans, you know, including myself, it, it almost seems like a, um, now I've now I've done what I should do. I've said thank you for your service, and that's it. You know, that's the end of it. There's no reflection really on what that word service means, what it might mean to you know to individual veterans. There's no reflection on the fact that um, not only that we need to do things for veterans, but that we need to learn from them you know, as well. That's, that's the service. So when I, when I, you know, I, I always think both on Veterans Day Memorial, um, I think of a, of a friend of mine who, um, you know, in our last week of the war, uh, switched places with me on a, on a mission and, and was killed two days before he would have left, you know, Vietnam at age 19. And what I, what I think, you know, when I hear thank you for your service, I think about, well, I want you to think about him. I want you to think about Jim Childers and what the cost that was that, that you know, for the, he, he missed everything in life because of that. He never got to do what I got to do. He never got to go home and get married and have children, you know, and write books and everything else. It was all snatched away from him at age 19. So thank, thank him, you know, but think also about what that, how, how much that costs. Don't, don't just make it an empty phrase you use, you know, and then go out to the Veterans Day sale, you know, get your lawn furniture. Make, make, make it mean something. I have uh, two uncles who fought in the Vietnam War. Uh, one died when his wife was pregnant with their only daughter, and another one survived but was deeply traumatized. I think I think about them every day. Um, and I think, you know, um, I, I think we, we shouldn't just think about veterans and those who fought in the war just on a certain day of a year. We should think about them often, and and we we honor their deaths and their their pain and what what what, what the lives that were lost by changing so that one day no person has to fight in a war again. And I think if we make that commitment to each other, that would be a great thing. I mean, I really imagine in a in a world where people can live in peace with each other. To think about it, why is it so hard? You know, we were we we are born into this earth, and and how hard is it to live in harmony? Why why are there always wars? And we have done so much destruction to this earth already, to each other's already. We should grow up one day to, to be able to speak with each other rather than fight because. That's, you know, violence. When violence starts, there's revenge and it will never stop. And this book is about ending that circle of violence. You know, Grandma Ziolan said, when you bear grudges, you are the one who have to bear the burden of sorrow. So you have to forgive and you have to move on. And you have to end that circle of violence to be able to, to, to build peace. And I really hope all of us, you know, if we celebrate or we respect veterans, we work towards peace so that 
no man has to fight in a war again and no man has to die in a war again. It seemed that the work touches on pessimism, on the violence of war, on, on the destructiveness, on death and pain. But at the same time, I cannot end today's discussion without saying that they will also talk about optimism and hope for the future. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me. I want to thank uh, Rachel and uh, Neil for you know having me in the last minute. You know, it took me two months to have an interview for my American visa. <laughs> so Vietnamese is like in, almost impossible to travel to the US. So it took me two months to get a visa interview. And by the time I I knew I was coming because I'm coming for, for the award ceremony in, in Ohio. So I'm so grateful that you decided to host me. It's my great honor. Thank you to Professor Horn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending our Zoom seminar. Thank you. Sending you many hugs. Thank you. Thank you.